Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at Daniel 11, verse 44 to 45 with the present truth application. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that um, we can open your word together, that we can um, receive light for our feet. And we're thankful for each person that's searching for truth. We just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and our minds, that um, we can have an understanding of our situation in this world. And Lord, we need you every day. We know there's many burdens and trials that face us and uh, that we face, and we just pray for your help. Uh, be with us in this study. Correct any mistakes and errors we may have in our understanding. and Guide and lead, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Man. Well, I've been spending a bit of time analyzing some of the numbers of these verses. So there there are lots of little details and how they all fit together and what they mean exactly. It's going to take a little bit of time to sort through. Uh, but the first thing I want to look at is the tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So we know that this message, the tidings out of the east and the north and the, and the present truth application is going to be July 18, 2020. That parallels with uh, the loud cry of the third angel, the everlasting gospel. So that's in historical application. And uh, there are these two messages, the east and the north. So the, the tidings out of the east are, are uh, behold, the bridegroom cometh. That is, it's the message of Christ coming. and um, uh, one of the things we want to look at in connection with that first is if we go to Revelation chapter 16. And uh, now this is something which back in the 1980s when I was studying um, Lewis F. Weir's writing, he, he addresses. So he addresses Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and uh, he brings us to the sixth plague. We'll, we'll see how this applies here. It says in the sixth angel, I'm going to get rid of the Greek numbers there. They're just distracting. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, um, this idea of the kings of the east, how is it generally understood by, well, what would, what would you suggest if we look at, at the east? Now, Louis F. Weir wrote a paper called The Kings from the Sunrise um, to address this. Louis F. Weir wrote this paper, and in this paper, he's going to address uh, the Eastern question, which he, he has uh, in his contents. It's got the Eastern question, uh, fertile field for false prophecies. There'll be a war between the East and the West. Uh, Satan will start wars and strife, eventually unite the world against the church. The kings that come from the sun rising, the glorious message for the church. And so he's going to address this in this paper. I don't, uh, I don't want to go to too much detail in the paper itself. So he's going to address U Uriah Smith's problem and some of the things that were coming into Adventism in, in the mid 1900s, mid 20th century. So when he takes this kings from the sun rising in Revelation 16, verse 12, and he, he just saying the revised version says kings from the sun rising instead of from the east, is of utmost importance. It is the one that was sent to cheer the hearts of all Christians, the heart of all Christians, and particularly the remnant people to scatter all darkness and bring in the light of heaven and to give strength, courage, and enlightenment to the people of God. First, where is one verse to substantiate the teaching that the kings from the sun rising are the heathen? Right. So there is this view that um, that takes in this literal application of Armageddon and tries to say that when the river Euphrates dries up, then we're going to have this this battle. Right. So I'm not going to go into all the details because there's lots of different views. So he's, I'm just going to read this section here. So he says first. Where's one verse to substantiate the teaching? I don't know if people can see that. It's probably pretty tiny. I'm going to zoom in. First, where's one verse to substantiate the teaching that the kings from the sunrising are the heathen? 
The expression from the sun rising has already been mentioned in Revelation 7 verse 2. With reference to a rise of God, it should be God's last day message of Sabbath reform. Uh, We must conclude, therefore, that this message came from the heathen, from China, from Japan, except must we conclude, therefore, that it came from China, Japan, etc. The following extract, which is really an explanation of Revelation 7-2, gives the words spoken by Sister White in a vision at the home of Brother Otis Nichols near Dorchester, Massachusetts, uh, November 18, 1848. She said, he, God, was well pleased when his law began to come up in strength, that the Sabbath truth arises as is, and is on the increase stronger and stronger. It's the seal. It's coming up. It arises, coming from the rising of the sun. Like the sun, first cold, grows warmer, and sends its rays. When that truth arose, there was but little light in it, but it has been increasing. Oh, the power of these rays. So this is recorded by J.M. Loughborough, questions on the ceiling message. So the idea here is that we can't make an assumption that the kings that come from the sun rising is referring to kings from the east. And and a lot of people, especially in in the context of Islam, so some people, you know, put China or different places. Some people would put Islam here, um, that this is going to be an attack by Islam. Now, we know this is the sixth plague, right? So this is something that happens after the close of probation. And we, we also can't really say that this is just the seal of God coming, Christ coming to seal his people, but to gather up his people. So this is a conflict that happens when the river Euphrates dries up. Now, of course, this is not literally talking about the river Euphrates. We know that this goes back to the fall of Babylon, right? And so this is addressing the fall of Babylon. That's what we would understand. Yeah, and so, in a spiritual sense, yeah. Yeah, and so the way of the kings of the east, this would be a reference to who historically – who are the kings of the east historically when the river Euphrates dries up and literal Babylon falls? Cyrus and Darius. Yeah, and Cyrus and Darius, okay. And Cyrus is a type of Christ. He's the Lord's anointed. So that is what the reference is to. It's not a reference to Islam or to China or anything like that or Japan. Just because they have a flag that represents the rising sun. We have to look at what the Bible says about it. And so we, we would go back to Cyrus, and we, we know that study, right? We, so we know the study about Cyrus. He was surnamed before he was born by Isaiah, or by God, but Isaiah records it, God's words. And then we see this three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So one is we know that this is symbolic. I mean, maybe when I was a teenager and I first, you know, read the book of Revelation and tried to figure out. I was pretty scared because, well, you know, there's all these strange creatures, um, but they're just symbols. They're not to be understood, literally. And then we're going to see, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then when we look at this, he gathered them together into a place in the Hebrew called, tongue called Armageddon, We know that this is a spiritual battle. This is not talking about some battle between earthly armies. This is about a battle between the kings of the east, east, which represents Christ at his second coming and preparing the way that the kings of the east might be prepared, right? So it's dried up. And, And so this is the battle. This is going to be the battle of Armageddon, which is the same as the time of Jacob's trouble. So that's the sixth plague. So when we deal with the message from the east in Daniel chapter 11, tidings out of the east, that's why we tie that to the message of Christ's second coming. So Daniel 11 verse 44, but tidings out of the east. Now we have tidings out of the north. Now we know that, of course, Babylon comes from the north. It's it's the kingdom from the north. But we know that ultimately uh, the north refers to the Mount of the Congregation on the sides of the north. And Christ is going to regain, so to speak, 
his throne. That is, he's going to take over the world. So we say that because it's Satan's world right now, that the, 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 the coming out of the north, that that's going to represent uh, the message of um, Babylon has fallen. So we're just going to say the east refers to the second coming of Christ. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then he's going to come and he's going to conquer Babylon. So that's the tidings out of the north. Now, we know that uh, Swearingen, in his book, he's going to, the title of his book is Tidings Out of the Northeast. Now, why does he call it Tidings Out of the Northeast? What, what is his, his argument there? Anybody know? Why he doesn't call it tidings out of the east and out of the north. He calls it tidings out of the northeast. I don't know if anybody has looked at his. Well, Babylon is kind of like east, but it, it approaches the um, the Palestine or the land of Israel from the north in the sense that it has to sort of go and a sort of look around the fertile crescent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it's so going to be. Go- yeah. So there is an easterly aspect. Do that as well as the northerly aspect. Yeah, so so we have an east and the north aspect to it. So there are two messages, but they really come together, right? Yeah, you could say that. So I'm 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 gonna have here just gonna read this is in swearing then we're gonna take a look at this, just see what he says. It's been a while since I read this. Okay, it says, but up to this point, we have established the passage of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 43, demonstrates that the papacy will ultimately seek to break atheistic communism, Christendom, spiritual Israel, and Islam into compliance with global, global Sunday legislation. Now, I don't really agree with him about Islam, and that's in verse 43. We didn't look at what he said about that. I mean, we could maybe examine it a little bit just to see what he says. But anyway... He says, uh, yet there is one remaining spiritual rival left in the world today that is preventing Roman Catholic domination, the movement of Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventist Church is the only major spiritual force in the modern world that promotes the true Bible Sabbath in opposition to Rome's mark of Sunday sacredness. Therefore, at some point, the papacy will attempt to bring this particular movement into compliance with Sunday legislation. We will soon discover that an attempted papal subjugation of Seventh-day Adventism is the actual theme of Daniel verse 11 to, or Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45, 44 to 45. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. So he says, uh, um, but tidings out of the east and north shall trouble him. Early in verse 43, we saw the escape of Edom, Moab, and Ammon from papal authority. And we will discover that this subpassage describes how this escape will actually take place through tidings given from the east and north. When we consider the word tidings, the Apostle Paul used it synonymously with the word gospel, stating, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Therefore, the word tidings describes a specific gospel message that will trouble the papacy, seek to hinder her desire for global domination. An understanding of the north and east will confirm this conclusion. We have already established that the north is a symbol of God's dwelling place. Um, Psalm 48, verse 1 and 2, and Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14. So we're, we're familiar with both of those. Beautiful for situation is the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And we know talking about uh, the king of you know, Isaiah. I think it's the king of, is it Tyre? Or Babylon. Anyway, uh, talking about it, using him in, in the sense of Satan, that he wants to sit upon the mount to the congregation on the sides of the north, right? So there, those are both referenced there. Um, concerning the east, the Bible reveals that the sealing angel comes from the east. God's glory comes from the east. Israel entered the earthly sanctuary from the east. Jesus returns the second time from the east. And in the battle of Armageddon, the spiritual river Euphrates will be dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east, Christ and his heavenly angels, at the second advent of Christ. Thus being similar similar to the north, the direction of the east is also symbolic of God's dwelling place. 
As we piece these concepts together, we conclude that the phrase tidings out of the east and out of the north describe a specific gospel message of heavenly origin that will oppose the work of papal Rome as this power attempts to bring the world into compliance with Sunday legislation. Christ prophesied that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And as a result, the threefold group called Edom, Moab, and Ammon will heed the call of this global gospel message and escape from the grasp of the papacy by refusing to submit to Sunday legislation. Okay, so I think it, it's pretty clear that we can connect these things. Now, this, of course, reminded me also of Acts chapter 27. When we study this in detail, if you remember, there's the storm. And that storm was called the Eurocludon, it says in the King James. It's Eurocludon in Greek. And the understanding I have is it's actually usually described by a Greek and a Latin word mixed together. So um, Euro is Greek. Um, the other word, I can't remember it. Uh, it's kind of like Clydon, but it, it's a Latin word. And it means, um, the, the idea is that it means northeast or east and north. So that this is a wind, a tempestuous wind from the northeast. Now, if we think about this in the context of, of Acts chapter 27, and we, when, and if we try to compare these things, this northeast wind that's going to hit the ship, what did the ship represent in Acts 27? How did we understand the ship? It's got 276 people on them, on it. There's three Aristarchus, Paul, and Luke that represent, uh, the priests. The 273 other ones represent the Levites. We're going to look at this a little bit more on Sabbath. When it comes to the study on the symbolic use of numbers. But can we, can we compare this tempestuous wind, this northeast wind that's going to take, cause the wreck of this ship? Can we compare it to uh, tidings out of the north and out of the east? Or is there a comparison? Is there a contrast? How would we understand that? I thought we had compared it with Islam being the wind out of the east. Okay, so we, we have the wind out of the east, Islam, and then it's also out of the northeast. Right. So there there is a comparison. We wouldn't say that this wind is the gospel message. No. So this is something that is the gospel message is going to address. So the north is going to represent a message regarding Babylon and the east wind about Islam. That's the way that we understand it here. So these are counterfeits of the truth, right? Babylon seeks to sit upon, and I'm just going to look at this one, Ezekiel. It's not Ezekiel, Isaiah. Where is it? Isaiah 14. Yeah, so this is going to be um, this proverb against the king of Babylon. How they're fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Um, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So here in, in Isaiah 14, we have the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, which we know is Christ's throne. It's the table of showbread in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So in counteraction to the message of Babylon and counteracting the message of, of Islam is the everlasting gospel. The message of Christ's coming to take his throne which is the Mount of the Congregation on the sides of the north. That's where it is. And also for him to come from the east, right? So that, that's the message of behold, the bridegroom cometh. So, so, um, so if we put that together, we can see that this message in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44 is the everlasting gospel. It's not it's not that Islam is coming and that Babylon is coming, right? Because the one that's going to be troubled is the papacy. Another connection so, with yeah. So with the uh, Eurotiden, the mm -hmm. um, it brings them it brings them to Malta. Yeah. So Malta means honey. Okay. And um, so that's like uh, you have that connection then with the uh, Islam. In Revelation chapter 10, that, uh, 
uh, Muller writes the Eat a Little book. Yeah. As sweet as honey in their mouth. And that was a restraint of Islam, which you can maybe put down into it being like an, an east wind being restrained. Yeah. So you can maybe uh, make a connection there. And Hank Ezekiel, he talks about, uh, he has a, a similar, he eats a little book mm-hmm. as well. There's like a honey aspect there, I think. Yeah. Chapter two, chapter three. Yeah. And so, yeah, just. Yeah, it's chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I'm not. I don't think he maybe connects. There's maybe not a wind or anything there, but I can't. I'm not too sure. I'll have to look at it again. But I just remember seeing some connections with that, drawing them together. Yeah, and and so the idea is that this is a message. So the message of Daniel 11 verse 44. What we're just trying to establish is that this is the the, the everlasting gospel message represented in "Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and Babylon is fallen, is fallen." could characterize this message. Right. You would agree with that, Stephen? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Now, just some other little interesting connections. The significance of, I'm not particularly certain, but when we take took the phrase, the king of the north and the king of the south, and we took the Hebrew numbers, it added up to uh, the number of inclusive days from when I was born to November 9th, 2019, whatever it was, uh, can't remember the number, but we probably have it in our footnotes somewhere. I know we put it somewhere in our notes. Anyway, it, it, it's somewhere. And then, then I was looking at this idea of north and east. So if we take, uh, the northeast and so that 6828, better get in the right spot here. Right. So we got, uh, the east is 4217 and 68, what, 6848 and plus 4217. Okay. I did that wrong. 68. It's okay. It's going to give us 11,065. And what was I doing with that? I'm trying to remember now. I can't remember what I did. Um, 11,065. Okay, so it's going to be 108 days more than 30 years. Okay, so that's, let's see if I can remember. So if we go to 1989. Okay, well, I can't remember. Well, we have 108, which is a symbol. It brings us to February 25th, 2020. If we go from November 9th, 1989, it must have been something else. Okay, I don't remember now. So 30 years and 108 days. Okay, well, I'm going to leave that for now. I, I figured something out, but I don't think I did it right. So 11 years, 30 years and, and 108 days. So it should fit somewhere. Is there anything about February 25th, 2020? Oh, I see. Here's what I did wrong. I knew there was something wrong. Okay, there it is. Okay, so anybody notice a mistake in the document? That's why. So north is not 6848, but it's 6828. So where that brings us to, okay, here's what we have. I'll do it this way. Okay, so we're just going to draw a line here with this. And all these dates are going to be wrong until I correct them. So we're going to go here. So we've got February 6, 1963. And then we're going to have here, just put it here, I guess, 1989. So this is going to be November 9th. 1989, and then this is going to be, forgot to save the other thing. And then we're going to put, so we got uh, February 6, 2020. Okay, so I'm just putting these these spans of time and connected to these words. So if we go from 1989 to February 6th, that's going to be the span of time that's represented by East and north. So this is going to be 10, um, 11,065 days. Okay. And then, um, we go here. So is this at all significant? I mean, obviously it's just connecting stuff from my life into, and this is going to be, this is going to be the king of the north and the king of the south. Okay. So in both cases, we got, um, so we got the king of the north and the king of the south. These add up to 
this number, which is the number of days from the end of February 6th um, and uh, to the beginning of November 9th, 2019. And then if we take just the words east and north and we add them together, 11,065, that's going to be the number of days inclusive of November 9th, 1989. Or no, again, that's going to be an ex- that's going to be an exclusive date from the end of November 9th, 1989, to the beginning of February 6, 2020. So, is this significant that these November 9ths are tied to my birthdays, the, the day I'm born, and my 57th birthday? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So I don't know. Now, 57, that's three metonic cycles, by the way. So that period of time altogether is 20,000. Now, my, now my birthday is just 89 days after. So my 57th birthday was 89 days after November 9th, 2019. So it's just uh, 20,819 days. And that gives us um, three periods of 600 or 6,939 and two thirds, right? Which is uh, a metonic cycle. So I'll just show you here. So there's the number of days divided by three. So it's 20,819 days to my 57th birthday. If you divide it by three, you get this number, six, nine, three, nine, and two thirds, right? And a metonic cycle is, it's it's a bit more precise than that, right? Because you're going to have this pattern, but they're going to define it as 6,940, which would be whole days. But if you do it more precisely, one way you would do it is you would take 235 months uh, times 29.530587. And you would get this number. So you can see it's, you know, it's the way that, that it is in 57 years and whole, whole years divided by three, it's going to be 0.66666, right? So this is pretty close. So you can see how, how that works. So the question is, is this, is this significant? How would it, does it seem to matter that we, we can tie my birthday in? So 20,819 days, three metonic cycles. I don't see how it matters. Okay. You don't see how it matters. So, yeah. okay. So does it matter that, is it just a coincidence that if we take the phrase king of the north, king of the south, and we count it from my birthday, that it brings us to November 9th, 2019. Now, we already have my birthday marked, right? So we have it marked as part of the 777 chiasm. That is from the, the Mayan date of 13000, which is exactly between the two dates of June 22nd, 2011, and June 22nd, 2014. Those two dates that Jeff marked from when he first receives the money for the School of the Prophets, and then they have that camp meeting that starts in 2014 on that date. And so the center date is that Mayan date. And then if we count uh, from my birthday, uh, 52 years is is going to bring us to 504 days past the Mayan date. 52 years is 18,720. And then 273 days later is my actual 52nd birthday. So can we make anything out of this? So you say, Jeff, it doesn't doesn't seem to make any sense to you. Right? Um, it makes some sense, but well, can it tell us anything as far as interpreting this passage? That that is the question because this is about a message. Because we're looking at the present truth application now, right? We're not we're not thinking about the historical application. We have the historical application. And, and would it would it suggest then that this message of the king of the north and the king of the south and the message of the east and the north 
ties to this message dealing with our message of November 9th and July 18th. Because we already connect the February 6th to July. Probably tie, I could probably see that tying together yeah. like that. Yeah, oh, oh, and I put the wrong number there because this is going to be 11,045, right? Because I had had that other number before. 11,045 days, not 65 days. Okay, so let's just take a look at that again. So Angela's just made a couple of comments about um, the word north, 6828 also has gloomy as a translation, taking us to Joel 2.2. 2. Joel 2 speaks of God's judgment, Christ's return and preparing for this. And then 6.8.2.8 plus 4.2.1.7. Uh, okay, it looks like Daniel 11, verse 45, which is, um, although this appears in Daniel 11, verse 44. Okay, so it's kind of interesting there, I guess. That uh, it brings us to the end of Daniel 11, verse 45. Okay, so so maybe as we look at other things, we will start to see how these things, this the significance of this. But I would just say that this has to do with this message. So the message that, if we're going to look at it in a present truth application, we can tie it to the message of November 9th. The fact that it's tied to my birthday in both of these different ways, the two different November 9ths. Which messages are, and the messages and individuals that uh, you know God used to bring out the things. Yeah, yeah, and and it's already tied to my birthday. July 18, twenty twenty is tied to my birthday, and and is November ninth, two thousand nineteen, but also to my fifty seventh birthday. We have this connection as well. So my fifty second and my fifty seventh, and other birthdays have also been tied in. Uh, you know, Stephen's birthday. So remember with Stephen's birthday, from when he's born, there's 11,900 days to September 11th. And if you count from November 9th, 1,190 days, it comes to his birthday again, right? So that ties together 9-11 and 11-9. Now, the, the mistakes that some people could make is that this somehow makes, you know, people special or prophets or things like that. And we don't believe that, right? It just it just relates to a fact of a message that was given, and it ties symbolically uh, people to that message, right? Doesn't make them like a prophet that everybody has to listen to me now because my birthday fits in some kind of pattern, right? And people make this type of mistake all the time. You know, they'll they'll find some significant span of time or something that connects to their birthday. And to some event, and, I, and I've read lots of things, people doing this type of thing, and then all of a sudden they're a prophet, and everything that they say is true, and everybody has to listen to them. And if you don't listen to them, then you're going to be lost. And and this is not at all what we're saying. You know, there's no nothing that can uh, make somebody an authority over God's word or that um, it makes them a prophet just because there are these structures. Right? So I, I think it's an important point that always has to be emphasized that uh, these are just things that happen. We should expect it with lots of people. Oops, I keep putting decimals instead of commas. I think if everybody did that, did that, they'd probably see something. Well, that's the thing is, I mean, we see we see it with the run. We see it with the white. You know, I've seen it with other people's birthdays. They fit into a structure. You know, people will have like just, you know, the date that they were married, you know, like October 22nd. Or well, we even seen it with, uh, I think, wasn't it um, Bronwyn's and her husband's anniversary was November 9th, if I remember correctly. And then we've seen Jeff's birthday fit into these lines, of course. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so this just is is just showing that we're part of this message, but it, it's pointing to specific aspects that are given by different people, different aspects of the message. And um, and it's it's applying to the present truth application. So that is we're not saying that this is the primary application of these. 
we're using these Strong's numbers uh, to bring us to understanding what, or confirming, I guess, what these messages are. So when we say that the tidings are the message of July 18, 2020, out of the East, right? So that's the message, um, behold, the bridegroom cometh, that connects us to the 26th day of the fourth month, Josiah Lich's prophecy. And that is, uh, that's going to be um, the message of Christ coming. Now we say, well, why Josiah Lich's prophecy? Because that's not specifically talking about the second coming. But we know that Islam is symbolized from the East as well. So that, so it's the message of the second coming in that sense, right? If that makes sense to people. And then we have tidings out of the North and that's going to be connected to the destruction of Jerusalem, the 10th day of the fifth month. Now it's going to be about Babylon has fallen, right? So you can see the East as this counterfeit of Christ's second coming. And you can see Babylon taking the throne of the Mount of the Congregation on the sides of the north, being tied together there. And so we have Josiah Lich's prophecy and the prophecy of Josiah, which comes from Ezekiel. Um, those two symbols, the 10th day of the fifth month, 26th day of the fourth month, uh, represent this message of July 18th in connection with these main lines of prophecy. And then what we were saying is that uh, shall trouble him, and I'm saying that our human nature is troubled, that this is a message that is the everlasting gospel, and it's supposed to bring about a, a change in us. That's the purpose of this. And, and we are in this movement, and the question is, are we being changed? And somehow within this movement, this message of July 18th is demonstrating and developing two classes of work worshipers, right? We have those whose characters are going to be patterned after Christ and those that are going to be patterned not after Christ, right? After human nature, after Satan's thinking. And so, so it's, it's a very serious message in within this movement that we can't safely reject the message of July 18, 2020. Now, we're never saying anything about individuals themselves because we can't judge the human heart. So we're not, we're not making a call and we're not saying, yeah, if, you know, you, you are lost because you haven't accepted this message or anything like that. We're just saying that there's a reality about this message that's going to be part of what develops our character. How we react to others is going to be the biggest issue. And, the reality is that this message cuts across our nature, and, and we could see that. We can see how, you know, having a disappointment, um, how it has, to, how we have to exercise faith and trust in God, not follow man, but follow Christ individually. Uh, that takes a lot because our nature is to look to somebody to follow. It's much easier following a person, something you can see than to trusting in God, someone you cannot see. For human nature, it's a lot easier. Okay. Wouldn't that be like making an idol, so to speak? Yeah, well, it, it is. You know, I, I just I just understand, uh, you know, how it it's so much easier. Like, when, when I was growing up as a teenager, you know, I, I used to be uh, you know, into music, right? That's why I'm a musician. I remember my brother David got me uh, an album, uh, John Michael Talbot's uh, The New Earth. You know, and I was listening to rock music and stuff. And then I got this sort of folk album, really mellow album. And uh, I thought, man, this this is so boring. And and I, I really got into John Michael Talbot and actually learned to play the guitar, all my finger style stuff from John Michael Talbot's uh, songbook that had the tablature in it. So it was easy to learn stuff before I learned to read music properly. But anyway, John Michael Talbot, he then became a Catholic and, and then he started a, a hermitage in, uh, in Arkansas up in, uh, it's a place called Eureka or something. Can't remember if that's the name of the place. It sounds right. 
So he has this hermitage. And so he became a Franciscan monk. So I was really into John Michael Talbot's music. And it became like almost like scripture songs. I mean, he would use scriptures, but not to King James. And uh, very mellow music. And that's kind of what my music is like. It's If you listen to John Michael Talbot, you listen to my scripture songs. They're very similar in style. Uh, same sort of picking style. Same sort of, sort of melodies um, and so forth. But anyway, at one point, you know, I really thought this idea of becoming like a Franciscan monk would be so cool. You know, you sit in your cave and because he has a cave, believe it or not, where he would sit and write songs. And I thought, you know, this would be so cool. It'd just be so easy. But I realized that it, it may seem like it's, uh, but it, it's not the cross, right? It, it is, it appeals to human nature, right? This sort of asceticism, I, I, that's not how you pronounce it, asceticism. When people, people can delude themselves into believing they're righteous by doing all of these religious acts. Right. I mean, obviously, if you're sitting in a cave uh, writing scripture songs, you can think you're pretty holy, you know, especially if you're like the head of the hermitage and, and you know, everybody does what you say. Uh, it's not like living in the real world. Right. The idea is it can create an illusion that you are righteous. And, and there's lots of other ways in which that can happen. Right. So true righteousness is living Christ's righteousness in this world of sin and suffering with all of the real trials and struggles that we face, right? Like if you joined a monastery or something like that, I mean, all your financial cares are taken, you know, they're taken care of. Um, all you have to do is do some charity work. You understand what I'm saying? Do people kind of understand what I'm saying and how that it can be a delusion? Oh, be... yes, to the next Catholic argument. Okay. Yeah. So, but there's many other ways that Satan can do this. We can think that we are righteous because we, we keep the Sabbath, because we pay our tithe, because we fast twice in a week, or, you know, because we're, we're, we're vegan, or because, because we believe certain things, or we recognize certain things. We recognize the Catholic Church as the Antichrist. And, and, and so we can use all of these things as a cloak to hide the reality of the fact that we are sinners and we are not like Christ, but we can dress up like Christ, right? We can, we can, and some people will go to these types of extreme, extremes, you know, becoming an aesthetic, aesthetic. I think it's an aesthetic, but anyway, uh, you know, living in a cave or doing things like that, being a hermit, being a monk, uh, being a Seventh-day Adventist, being a present truth Seventh-day Adventist. But if we are facing the truth, it's going to reveal to us our need of Christ. So the next part here where it says, therefore, he papal Rome shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to make away many. So there's these tidings that come out of the north and the east. And, and we can look at the historical application. The historical application is pretty clear that this is uh, going to bring us this is the time before the close of probation though it will include time after the close of probation as well but Satan knows he has but a short time he, Satan is putting all of his pressure upon those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus that that who is he he is focusing on here he doesn't really care about the loss so much he is seeking to overthrow God's people and with fury, so to destroy and utterly make away. So, so how do we how do we relate this? Yeah, and we noted that this two seven six three. If we take two zero seven six three, uh, that's one hundred and forty four square uh, squared, right? So it relates as a symbol to the one hundred and forty four thousand. This two seven six three. So he's seeking to destroy the one hundred and forty four thousand. How does that relate? to our message how does that relate in the present truth application any thoughts on this because because who is it that's going forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many it's it's satan ultimately right that's how we looked at that the papacy yeah it's the papacy but i'm going to say satan through the papacy 
Yeah, he's behind it, definitely. Uh, we'll say through papal Rome. Right. So we know that that ultimately this is about Satan. The Pope doesn't really have any personal best, vested interest in this. I mean, he's going to be lost. Satan is trying to take out as many as he can. We need to be aware that those who adopt that mindset could be within the movement right now. Right. So that's why when we look at the present truth application, I'm not going to attribute this to a person, but it's going to be through FFA. Whether people would unwittingly be doing this, they wouldn't know that they're connected to Satan, but through FFA, that this is going to happen, right? And we, we have seen it happening. Now, now we have some numbers there, whether those numbers are going to, uh, work in the chronology of what's happening and what has happened within the movement. I don't know because I haven't looked at them all. Uh, I know 3318. That's going to be less than 10 years, right? So it's going to be nine years, just a bit over nine years, actually. Nine years and a little bit, nine years and a month. So I don't know where, where I would put that. You know, if we put nine years and a month somewhere, you know, is there any place that we, we would put that as a number that would connect something? I'm just going to try one here. You know, this always takes a long time I mean, looking at these numbers. So we got, uh, he shall go forth with great fury, 1419. I don't know where I would connect these, but we're, we're going to have to look at those numbers in more detail uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to try to get, take a bit more time with these. 2534. So that's going to be uh, with great. So there's with great fury, 2534. 473. So I don't know. I, I'm going to have to look at this in more detail later. It's going to take too long. But anyway, we're going to see that we have this going forth, shall go forth. So the word go forth, yatsa, this word becomes a symbol in and of itself. Where do we see this word? Well, we're going to have the first time it's mentioned, I believe, is in Genesis 1, 12, right? When he brought forth uh, grass and herb yielding seed. So it's just the word brought forth. I'm pretty sure that's the first time. It's translated lots of different ways, as you can see. Um, or you can't see because you're not looking at what I'm looking at. There we go. So it's translated lots of different words, like lots of different ways. But that's just because well, it's one simple. Of them, sorry, that one was, of them is shoot force. That reminds me of, of the budding. Remember the fig tree? Or Jeff yeah. was talking about the shooting force of the leaves. Yeah. Oh, but this, anyway, so this word yatsa, like the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Um, if we go back to um, Daniel chapter 9, now he's going to say here in 9.23 or 9.22, just seeing where he first starts. Yeah, so 9.22 he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm now come forth, 3318, to give thee still an understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, right? And I am come uh, to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the uh, matter and consider the vision. And then 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, right? And then know therefore and understand from the going forth, of the commandment. Now you're going to see here going forth is a related word to yatsa. That is, it's instead of a, a yod at the beginning, it's a mem at the beginning, it's matza. So there's a coming forth and there is a going forth. Now sometimes they'll translate yatsa as go forth, but but usually it's going to be matzah that's going forth. Now, notice a going forth such as the rising sun or the going forth of a command, right? So you can see that these words uh, are related to each other. Uh, but there's lots of different, it, it can be a place where, so it can be of east of the sun. But that that's matzah, right? And if we look up again, uh, Yatsa, which is Yod Sadi Aleph, instead of 
just going back here. The other one is Mem Sadi Aleph. Sometimes they put a, a, a Vav in there just to show the O sound. So it's, you can kind of work like a vowel. But um, it's usually Matzah, just without the Vav. Okay, so so this came forth here, Yatsa, to go out, come out, exit, go forth, to go, come out, or forth, depart, right? To come out, to cause to go out, to bring out, to lead out, uh, to be brought out, to be brought forth. Right? So you can see how it's, it's a very similar word. So the ones it, to come or go out is this one. The other one's the going out. Now, um, so we got Yatsa, as we said, there's lots of different places uh, that it's used, lots of different uh, meanings. Now, uh, it's this one here. Yeah. So in Numbers 33.1, these are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out. So notice you're going to have, they went forth. When did they go forth in Numbers 33, 1? What, what is the went forth? What year? 1533. Yeah, so 1533, see, yeah. And then it's going to describe their goings out, their matzah. And that's going to be the whole period of time in which they leave Egypt. It's going to include the 40 years journey in the wilderness, right? Right, because it says Moses wrote their goings out, their matzah, according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. Okay, that makes sense. Now, you're going to see here uh, in 1 Kings 6, verse 1, it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt. So the 480th year is going to be marked as the fourth year of Solomon's reign in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So there's 480 years from when he begins to build the house of the Lord, lay the foundation of the temple. And then this, when they were come out of the land of Egypt, is going to refer to when they have fully exited. So it's it's not referring to their times in the wilderness wanderings, but at the beginning it's going to refer to the end. And what's the other verse that you have uh, Stephen, it's in Psalms or something. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. you have one in uh, Ezekiel as well. But yeah, Psalm 114. Okay. It mentions coming out of Egypt and then it relates it to two the times when the, yeah, two times when the sea is driven back. Yeah. Okay. And, th- and this when Israel went out, so it's going to be Yatsa of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. Judah was his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea sought and fled. Jordan was driven back. Right? So it's going to refer to Jordan. So it's going to be talking about the Jordan, the second time that they crossed. So that's when they went out. And, and you say there's one in Ezekiel as well. So now, so we bring this up just to understand this word better. Right? So we're understanding what's happening in Daniel chapter 11. So this going forth of Satan, if we're going to use that number as a symbol, what is the symbol, I guess, is the question. Can can we take just this really, really common word and can we look at it as a symbol in relation to our message based on what we saw with this word? Can we relate it to a message? Because obviously... This is Satan attacking this message, but we're going to have, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, to utterly make away many. And then we're saying that that, the fact that this word go forth is used, can it be used as a symbol, either like to counteract the message, right? So he's going to go forth. Is this, is this showing a counterfeit message? I guess is the question. Could we use it that way? I think so, because it reminds me of Job chapter one, where Satan goes forth, like he's walking to and fro on the earth, and then he appears before before the rest of the angels and all the people that are coming from the different worlds. Okay, so so the way that I look at it is there's these tidings out of the north, the, the east and the north, that, that, that refers to the messages in this movement. 
But to counter that, there is a message in this movement through FFA that, that is a counterfeit message. It, it is going to counter the truth. It, is that a fair interpretation for the present truth message? So it says he shall go forth. And I would just say with a false message in the present truth application. Right. So I'm putting there. A distorted, uh, a distorted message. A what? Or a distorted message. Yeah, but, but it's a false message, right? You distorted, but, but it's false. It's not the correct message. And, and it is to counteract the message that it had been giving in the past. So it's a rejection of July 18, 2020. So we got this word to destroy. We're going to have to look at these in more detail uh, tomorrow, but right to overthrow, to bring down, to destroy. So um, that word destroys a period of 22 years and nine days. So I don't know where we would put that. Uh, onto that Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yeah, it's a different Hebrew word, but the idea that's to pull down or in pieces, break, destroy, overthrow. But that that's what I see happening, is that what, what Jeff is doing presently is he's... He's destroying his own message. It's definitely counterproductive. It doesn't naturally flow from what he taught in the past. He has to come up with a bunch of new interpretations, and these these things become self-contradictory. They, you know, it, you know, and I've spent a bit of time, you know, reading through the articles, trying to make sense out of them. And you know, I'm I'm not going to read all of the articles because that would be just too much time and there's no point they're not they're not organized but i am at least spending time looking at them which jeff is not looking at what we're doing right he doesn't know what we're, we're teaching but it, it's pretty clear that what he's doing is is an undoing of a message it's not he's not building upon a foundation he's tearing a foundation down the foundation that he built indeed and I'm not particularly certain why he can't see it, because I don't believe Jeff is lost. I believe that we would look at Jeff in the same way we look at what happened to Miller. It's definitely not not a productive message. And the people who are following Jeff, it's not going to help them. It's not going to help them spiritually. It's not going to help them intellectually. Well, they're so, looking upon it as a great work. And I'm thinking about what Ellen White said, that towards the end there would be a great work in the cities and so forth. Like they're already boasting about that. Well, what great work when you're revising, just like just like the the uh, communists do. They come in and revise everything, you know, and set up a whole new structure, which is horrible. Well, the thing is, it would be easy to make a more attractive message, and and I, you know, when it comes to how our videos are done, they're very simple and plain. They're not designed to. You know, we don't have a bunch of clickbait. We're not, we're not saying sensational things, you know, at the beginning of the videos. We're not dragging people along. We're not manipulating anybody in any way. We're just allowing God's spirit to speak to whoever is willing to listen. We're not, we're not browbeating people. We're not misrepresenting people. We're not distorting things. We're just accepting what is and we're allowing God to work. And this is a belief that I have about the work in the last days, which I gained in the upper room uh, studies, you know, back a um, long time ago. Uh, now, you know, so back in the 1980s when I'm studying in the upper room and I'm reading what Ellen White's saying about the work in the last days, that God takes it into his own hands, that it's it's not after man's order. It's not the machinery of man that accomplishes the work. And, and yet, every time that people try to, to do the work of God, it's going to fail. We have to trust that God is taking this, taking care of this. And, and I keep struggling with this, like, what is it that we're supposed to do? Right now, what we're supposed to do is study and put those studies for people to see. 
But we do know that the work will be finished, that God will cut it short in righteousness. So anyway, we need to go. Any final thoughts before we pray? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. We pray that you can bring us together tomorrow according to thy will. And um, we ask for continued help as we look at these things in Daniel chapter 11. Help us to recognize our need of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.